That's great. So um, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. It really is an honor um, to be talking here uh, on a kind of a birthday anniversary for DNA. I am, I'm not quite sure which generation I sit in. I sit in somewhere between, oops, let me, oh well, go back, somewhere, arrow up, arrow keys, I think they'll be back on this, on the Mac, oh this one, okay, here we go, does that work? Gosh. <laughs> I don't know, something changes and I don't know which one it is. Apologies. Main Mac. Main is it? Mac. So, which button goes forwards? Step, space. Which keyboard? Second okay, we're back. Okay, all right. Okay, so it is. Um, I, um, I, uh, I. Would you believe I did some wet work in my life when I was uh, 19 or 20 or something like that? And it was just before DNA sequencing really got um, into gear. And I was part of the generation, I think, who, who just was in that transition. Most of my life, I've lived with the genome. There's a little bit of my scientific life uh, I live without uh, a genome. And I'm very aware that modern scientists, growing up, just take it for, for granted. And that's a good thing. Um, it's really good that current researchers don't worry about it. They just go off and, and use it um, in all sorts of different ways. The thing I want to talk about is this question. Um, we created, Kevin mentioned, wonderful technologies to go off and determine the sequence of genomes. This is a little bit of hu the human genome. And there's a big question about what on earth do you do with this information now? It's a great use for all sorts of experiments, designing all different types of experiments. But biology, the genome really ends up being um, a kind of ultimate biological index. It may not actually tell you precisely what's going on, but it's a place to say, here on the genome um, is this molecule, or this molecule is controlled by this point on the genome. You may not understand everything that's going on, but you can say here, uh, here it is. And you do that by mapping where the molecules come from, sometimes biochemically, and sometimes you do it by mapping phenotypes and things like that, uh, by either using kind of genetic techniques, forwards and reverse genetics, and also using population style of genetics that Nancy just mentioned. And so as we um, uh, go from that sequence, we build up a series of things that we hang off the genome. And these really are using the genome as the index, so we have a protein coding gene structure that we perhaps understand by the RNA that it produces. We have variants that are across the genome. We have other things that we can measure. And when I describe all of these things together as genome annotation, and in fact, over the last 15 years of my life, this is what I've done. I've been trying to in effect, draw boxes uh, on screens that say uh, this bit of the genome uh, is involved, we think, in this molecule or this process or this aspect. And there's a, there's a theme that goes through all of these different areas. There's a business of generating high-quality data uh, with good data standards. Um, and rather critically, it's very obvious, but all of that data has to be available publicly. We integrate that data and we use the fact that the genome provides this index to make things non-redundant. And then we annotate, and it has to be stressed that I think that we're really still very, very much at the start of our, our process of understanding ourselves, uh, what all the different molecules that come from the genome do and how they play together. And I think this science will continue. The science, it's really the science of molecular biology. It's not the science of genomics. The science of molecular biology will go on for at least another century. Uh, I will still be doing this until I am old and gray. I'm getting there. Um, uh, and there will be future generations still doing this. And on the way, I think we'll make, be making lots and lots of other discoveries 
about ourselves and about other animals um, uh, that will help us understand, for example, disease. So this is a point where you have the pleasure of looking backwards, and um, here are some uh, rather dapper men who, who I know. So that's John and Bob. And this is the exciting bit, bit here that says that it's going to cut, this will be delivered five years ahead of schedule, those great year times. And it was about at this point when I was a young graduate student working with Richard Durbin. And uh, there was this problem. And the problem was in this green stuff. There was this rather stately process that was going along in the Genome Project um, uh, uh, about producing very high quality data. And then suddenly everybody just let everything loose for a period. Um, and people said, my gosh, we're gonna, we can't do it. We can't process the information, understand the information at the matching rate. We need to understand what molecules, what genes are part of these sequences um, at a faster rate. And so they basically had to shift a lot more into computers. And um, uh, these are genuine slides that I presented back in 2001. Um, and I, I remember, in fact, these, uh, these things. It was, a, if you can remember those days, the genome was in a bit of a mess. Um, it was a bit of a headache. It used to drive the old style uh, single gene geneticists up the wall because um, uh, there were like thousands of pieces on the floor and you were trying to put them back together again. And we had a variety of ways of, of sorting out how to make the gene, draft genome sequence more consistent with gene structures and actually predict gene structures inside of that. And it was also the start of, I think, more extensive or more thoughtful um, processes about delivering this information to a variety of scientists. And this is a very, very early screenshot of this system called Ensemble that I was involved in founding. Paul Fleecheck, my colleague, now runs this. Um, and uh, in fact, you can really see that the parts of these, these pages have changed a lot, but other parts, which is that you're drawing boxes, uh, have not changed uh, a great deal. And um, I, uh, there's a wonderful piece of history here um, because uh, it was before we had these data sets, we actually didn't know how many protein coding genes there were in the human genome. And it was an interesting period because I kind of grew up in a scientific community where you read a book and it said there are 100,000 protein coding genes in the human genome. And you said, sure, that's, that's, what, I, that's what I hear. Um, that's what I'm going to... Um, that's what I'm going to think is the right thing. And as this data came out, this was when chromosome 22 uh, from the Sanger Institute came out, and chromosome 21 that came out with a consortium, Stylianos and the uh, uh, Japanese uh, were both involved in chromosome 21. And um, it was very interesting. They're, they're very different chromosomes. They have very different uh, gene densities. And um, <laughs> at the time, you can see that the... the the number of genes predicted from these two things, 50,000 from chromosome 22 and 20,000 from chromosome 21. Now, it's really interesting. This number was considered to be really low. It was jaw-droppingly low. I can remember sitting in the room and having people going, no, it can't be that the human genome has 50,000, only 50,000 protein coding genes. Um, and, uh, and in Ensemble, we had at that point found evidence, confident evidence for 38,000 protein coding genes, we thought. We'll come on to this in a moment. Um, and so we were even more embarrassed. We, we were getting even more complaints uh, about us. And the consensus opinion was that chromosome 21 was a very gene poor chromosome um, and that one simply couldn't do the naive piece of scaling up from, from chromosome 21. And uh, I think I actually met many genomicists for the first time when I was in Cold Spring Harbor and I presented, I think, that slide. And I, I held up a book and I said, we're going to bet on this. Um, and in this year, I'll charge you $1. Next year, I'll charge you $5. And the year after that, I'll charge you $20 because our information will get better. And, and you buy a number, it's a sweepstake, um, and, uh, and please bet. And this is the distribution of bets over those three years. Uh, now, remember, these are, at Cosmic Harbor, these are genomicists. Um, they all should know what they're doing. 
uh, and they all, uh, uh, they were top of their game, all right? The real number <laughs> is on the left-hand side of this. Now, the conclusion I draw from this is that when you get a crowd of very intelligent people, if the very intelligent people have no data, they don't make good estimates. <laughs> when you give very intelligent people data, they make good estimates. Um, and the true answer, by the way, is still, it's, it's closer to 21,000, and then, then, then you get a very long argument about small orfs, and that argument can go on for an incredibly long time. Um, uh, but it's not going to go north of 22,000, 23,000. And in fact, we were so confident about that in 2003, that was the end of this, this betting process, that we were able to split the money for the three people who bet the lowest. And the, the reason why is in fact a, a, a Frenchman, Hugues Rose Crolius, had made the most outrageous statement uh, back in 2001 that there were tw only 26,000 protein coding genes. And everybody was going, <gasps> um, and so he bet his number, which is great, and then two other people sneakily bet just under him. Uh, uh, so, uh, so I felt it was a bit unfair uh, just to give it to the lowest better uh, in that situation because Oog had really anchored the process at the bottom. So that was um, about genes. And, and this story of, of generating information, integrating it, and annotating it, you can talk about variants, and other people have talked, Nancy's just talked, and other people have talked already about how really bringing old, very old pieces of quantitative genetics now back into the modern age is, is incredibly uh, empowering. But I'm gonna talk about this other thing, about the other stuff in the human genome. Um, and this is a, a variety of projects Again, integrated an annotation. And this is about outside of well understood protein coding genes. What are the things that are switching things on and off? And again, lots and lots of elegant molecular biology on individual loci have said, of course, there are things that are switching genes on and off in different places, but we don't have a sense. We can't draw boxes. We can't say, ah, this base, this switch, this cell type. So, um, for the last 10 years, and, and thankfully, uh, not thankfully, but I'm no longer quite so in bed with this, uh, but I spent a lot of my time on this project called ENCODE. So I'm gonna now give you an incredibly short whistle-stop tour of ENCODE. So just to get your head around ENCODE, there are three major axes. The different experiments that we did, the different cell types that we did those experiments in, and of course the genome. There were 164, I'm sorry, you can't read that probably, 164 different types of experiments in the published, in the paper that came out last year. And most of them are different chromatin immunoprecipitation experiments, chip experiments on different transcription factors. 182 different cell lines or tissues. There's quite a lot of primary tissue. But there's six key cell lines that we use. Three of them are classic biological laboratory workhorses. So HeLa, hep and K562. The three of them are normal carrier type cells. One is GM12878, the best known genome on the planet because she is the daughter in the thousand genomes trio. Um, and that's a lymphoblastoid cell line. The other one is H1ESC, a stem cell line. Um, and one of the reasons that was chosen, it was one of the six bush ticked stem cells in the bush era. Um, and uh, the third one is primary cells from um, umbilical cords, uh, HUVEX. And they, have, they do get a couple of doublings in, in the lab, but not, not many. And so the majority of these assays are done over these six cell lines. And then there's about 20 assays that's done over this range. And now this would go up somewhere in the ceiling, and this would continue somewhere over here. And it's actually a modest-sized experiment these days. Cancer projects are much bigger data-wise uh, than in code. But what it is complicated, it's very high dimensional because each experiment realistically is another dimension and each cell line or each experiment cross cell line is another dimension on, on the genome. So it's a very high dimensional data set to work inside of. And this is a consortium effort. I'm just one of the members of this consortium uh, uh, here. 
and there's a, a whole bunch of other uh, investigators, I think some of whom are in the audience, um, uh, 410 authors on the main paper, it's one of these crazy things. Um, but I'm going to come back to these guys. These are the lead postdocs um, in the consortium. And there's a very simple statement we say. We say, we generated high quality data, full stop. And then we move on. And in fact, that simple sentence hides an incredible process uh, of generating at scale this data. So if you want to know about running more chip seek than you've ever seen before, Flo Pauli from Hudson Alpha is your person. If you want to know more about RNA extraction and separation, that's Carrie Davis at Cold Spring Harbor. If you want to know how to process an insane amount of histone modifications, that would be Chuck Epstein at Broad. Now, I can't do justice um, to the Encopia. I encourage you to read the paper. And I'm going to take you on a sort of little sort of, the, the, the names here are going to change, by the way, so keep track a little bit of those names. And there's really two ways. One way is when we look at each experiment, one uh, by themselves, and one where we join experiments up. This is an example of two of an experiment. This is a, a DNA's one experiment done in UW by John Stamnopoulos' group. And you can see that we get enrichments across the genome. This is a very old piece of biochemistry known from the 1970s. Um, and we've taken that piece of biochemistry, or John has taken that piece of biochemistry, and rather than using a classic DNA southern blot style approach, he now slaps it onto a next generation sequencer, and rather than reading off bands on a gel, you now read enrichments um, across the genome. And you can see here, the, we have peaks. These are two biological replicates. And over here, those two peaks look very credible. But look at here. Here's one of the peaks on this side, and there's nothing here. Now, um, there's a, so this question is, do you believe this thing here? Now, this is a statistical problem. If you're a statistician in the audience, you'd say, uh, that's a problem. We've got a variance problem here. I want a good grip on the mean and the variance. Uh, if you give me about 30 replicates, um, I'll nail it for you. Uh, and if you're a biologist, you'll say, you must be joking. Uh, have you got any idea how complicated it is to grow up 10 million cells for each of these experiments? Plus, if we did 30 replicates for every experiment, I would divide my budget by 30 and would do 30-fold less assays. And so you could probably argue the statistician down to about five replicates, but most statisticians dig their heels in somewhere between five, uh, you know, seven, five, and four. Um, but thankfully, we had a very gifted non-parametric statistical group by Peter Bickel, and we were able to argue a piece of biological intuition that he, that group then turned into hardcore non-parametric statistics. And the intuition is, is that we have a whole genome's worth of this. So when we're assessing this little case here, we, we're doing it in the context of what we've seen elsewhere. And so what we're plotting here is the log of signal for one of these experiments for one replicate on the x-axis and for another replicate on, on the y-axis. And at the top of the signal space, it's correlated. So if you're high in replicate one, you're high in replicate two. But as you go along, you get points like this, relatively high in one replicate, but really quite low in the other replicate. And the intuition is that we have a signal portion which is correlated between the replicates and a noise portion which is not correlated. And once you make that assumption, you can actually write down a piece of non-parametric statistics that will draw a confident boundary between the noise and the signal, and we've colored that in this red-black. I mean, Peter calls this the irreproducible discovery rate, and it's a piece of statistical innovation that's been driven by this piece of biological data. Now, from this, you can do a rather simple thing, which is just sum up the number of bases by all the different experiments that we've done. And that total sum comes out when you do it over all experiments and all cell types at 80%. But this includes RNA and histone modifications. And we know that we surveyed H and RNA and histone modifications involved in transcriptional processes. So I try and emphasize this. You shouldn't be so surprised by this 80% number, because in fact, the genome is full of a lot of genes and a lot of introns. 
However, something that I was mu mu I myself much more surprised at are these, these middle numbers here. So these are DNAs1 hypersensitive sites. We get 15% of the genome covered by DNAs1 hypersensitive sites. And 8% of the genome covered by this is transcription chip seek cases. Now, a skeptic might well say, well, in these cases, you're only measuring an enrichment. There's actually a very small number proportion of bases that are triggering that signal. But we can very often find that. In DNAs1, there's a approach called DNAs1 footprinting. It's identical to what you did with Southerns, but you do it with next generation sequencing. And for ChIP-seq, you can find the bound motifs that are these specific base pairs here. And again, this is quite a high amount of the genome. And cumulatively, with the exons, uh, the, the coding and non-coding exons, it's coming up to 9% of the genome. And of course, ENCODE didn't look at every transcription factor or every cell type. So there's a lot of different cell types that we haven't looked at. And we, what we could do, though, is estimate to what extent we have seen all the elements. And so this is plotting out how many DNAs one elements when we've seen one cell line, two, three, four, five, all the way up to 60, whatever. Um, and it's non-redundant. So at the start, we accumulate more unique elements. But you can see it starts bending. But it doesn't flatten out. And our most aggressive fit suggests that we have seen 50% of the elements so far. And that's, we know, going to be an overestimate of how well we're seeing elements because we know that there are inaccessible cell types or transcription factor classes that we aren't so good at assaying. So a lot of the genome a lot of the genome, the, the vast majority of the genome is close to a biochemical event. The second statistic, I think, is the more important one, is that it's really close even to one of these band motifs or footprints. In other words, there are transcription factors or specific DNA protein contacts across all of the genome at some different place. Now, we've got a long road ahead of us to understand how and how these things are used and if they're used at all, in different mechanisms, in different diseases, in cancer, in different scenarios. But at least we have a catalog. We have a place to start to ask all of these questions. And Nancy uh, was uh, talking about the, the amount of GWAS uh, uh, cases that lay, lay outside of the genome. And although I wasn't here, I'm guessing that David was talking about the amount of selection on non-coding uh, um, uh, DNA in the stickleback. So there are many other stories about ENCODE, which I can't do justice to here. Um, so it would be great. So do, if you, if you can get Mike Snyder to give his talk, it's really wonderful about transcription factor co-associations. Roderick Gigo on splicing histone interactions. Uh, you can learn more than you ever wanted to know about RNA from Tom Jinjaras. Uh, DNA's one footprints. This is a beautiful set of experiments by John Stamenopoulos. And DMET, DNA methylation by Rick Myers. I want to just jump into one case. This is a case where we took a st step back from the data. And now, rather than looking at this experiment by experiment by experiment, we try to jointly analyze all of these experiments together. And we use two rather classical machine learning techniques, hidden Markov models and a dynamic Bayesian network. And what, in effect, they do is they color the genome. And the good thing about these techniques is we don't tell the method how to color the genome. We don't say, please learn about genomes. We just give it the data. We say, please organize yourself however you see fit. And then we compare that machine learning to well-understood annotation. And in fact, it's rather reassuring that the, the strongest signal is about promoters, about transcription start sites. Um, there are some unexpected cases. There's a chromatin state that sits over three prime ends, over poly-A addition sites. And that was uh, really unexpected. Um, but I'm going to dive into these things, which I describe as reassuringly interesting. And these are colors which, when we compared them to annotation, they, um, they were not close to genes. They were not at transcription start sites. But they did have activating chromatin marks, like H3K, uh, K27 acetylation, and the classic H4K, uh, um, H3K4 monomethylation, which is a classic um, enhancer signal. So we th thought that these were putative enhancers. And so we took a random sample of this. Remember that we had not trained at all on these things. 
And then we did both uh, cell line experiments, we did mouse experiments, but we also did this, which is my favorite fish. And this is a Madaka fish, there's his head, his body is going around here. This is his heart pumping blood around the yolk sac. And each one of these little dots is a blood cell, and blood cells in the fish are nucleated. And in this Madaka fish, we have a piece of ENCODE, uh, uh, element predicted by ENCODE to be an enhancer coupled to green fluorescent protein. Um, and so each one of these dots is, is uh, uh, a piece of human DNA creating green fluorescent protein in the red blood cells, in this case of this Madaka fish. And we get a good result. It's about 50% of the time in these different assays um, we see a specific enhancer um, activity. I have not been tracking time. Okay, cool. So this, I think, is, is for me, one of the nicest results that came out um, from ENCODE. And I think you've heard already by a variety of people about the incredible progress of genome-wide association. Um, you can't, you still, I was re opening my, my um, reading the index of Nature Genetics and seeing yet another four GWAS things. And I think it's great, it's an industry, but every human disease deserves a good, thorough genome-wide association to nail down all these regions. But as Nancy says, very often these things are found in the non-coding parts of the genome. Now what one assumes it was happening in a genome-wide association is in fact a very simple statistical technique where one's typing SNPs across the genome but you don't have to type every SNP because there's a correlation process that happens in the way that DNA works in the population, which means you only need to type one in 10 SNPs or one in 100 SNPs to effectively capture all the correlation. So this is the SNP that is reported, but one assumes that it's tagging um, a SNP that's in some functional region. And we have a catalog of these the reported SNPs uh, associated, statistically associated with phenotypes. So this plot, when I first saw this plot, I remember getting really, really excited, and then I got really, really sad, because I realized that there must be a mistake. Um, and then I got excited again when I realized that there was, wasn't a mistake. So let me talk you through that, uh, that peak and trough of this. So the excitement here is that these are different DNA um, encode annotations, DNAs1 hypersensitive sites or transcription factor binding sites. And this in the red is the overlap to this GWAS catalog organized by NHGRI, Terry Milonio and colleagues. And then these two blue bars on the right hand side are background SNPs from the 1,000 genomes or from the 69 um, complete genomes. And you can see the red is way above the blue. And so you think, yes. ENCODE is annotating GWAS SNPs. And then you think, oh, no, 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 no. This is all wrong. We have a bug. Um, because all those GWAS SNPs must be the tag SNPs. They shouldn't be the functional SNPs. We have a problem in our program. And so four different groups inside ENCODE went on about a nine-month bug hunt to explain why we're doing this. And the first and perhaps most kind of curious and interesting thing is when we look in particular at the older genotyping arrays, the very early AFI and Illumina arrays. And in fact, there's about a 1.3 or 1.2 enrichment for SNPs for functional regions. Now, I describe this a bit like Monopoly, if you ever played Monopoly, when you, you draw the community chess card and it says, bank error in your favor, please collect $10. This is design bias in your favor there were, were more functional SNPs on your array than you previously thought. If we could teleport ourselves back to 2003 and say to the chip design group, you know what, you can design a chip that has all the LD properties that you want and we're gonna enrich it by 1.3 for functional variants. They would have gone, brilliant, yes, that's the chip I want. Um, but they did that unwittingly. Um, and understanding how they did that is kind of interesting. So one of it was deliberate. They did try and get SNPs closer to promoters. That doesn't explain all the signal. And, and we think, or I think, the multiple processes of, for PCR optimization 
uh, was implicitly selecting for open chromatin, because open chromatin extracts better, and therefore PCRs better, and therefore the SNPs inside of open chromatin end up on your arrays more often. When we stir in as much as we can to explain away this difference, that's this match null distribution here, we get close to this red bar, um, so this is distance to the promoter, allele frequencies inside of introns, in, in intergenic, we cut the genome into, up into five different ways in five different directions to, to deal with gene density or conservation density or SNP density. All of those cannot explain away this signal. So we end up saying there are a significant number of functional SNPs in this GWAS catalog. You might say to yourself, well, that doesn't sound so interesting. I, I knew there must be some. Um, you know, I just didn't know which ones they were. This is not a very interesting fact. But the great thing about this is we can now take that signal and we can break it down into two axes. Now, the first axis here is encode types, different transcription factors in different cell types, and that's in green, and that would keep on going all the way around here. And then this is, in fact, DNAs1, and this would go even further, but I'm just showing you a subset. And then down on the left-hand side is different phenotypes or diseases. It goes height, SLE, Crohn's disease, et cetera. I'm just going to zoom in here. Um, so this is a subset of that table, which itself was a subset of the bigger thing. And at the bottom here, here's Crohn's disease. Now let me take you over here to Crohn's disease on this side. Out of the 20 loci that, have Crohn, that are associated with Crohn's disease that overlap with TFs, nine of them are active in T helper cells. Now that nine out of 20 is highly significant. These are very rare data sets in the genome. The genome's a very big place. Um, and I kind of agree when it goes over a chi-squared threshold. But this is not surprising. Crohn's disease, we've known, is an autoimmune disease. Um, and uh, it's awful gut disease. And we've known that it's been involved in T helper cells for a long time. However, this one here is much more surprising. Crohn's disease associated, in this case, with GATA2, a transcription factor. Now, that makes sense. The GATA2 transcription factor is involved in blood differentiation. But the Crohn's disease biologists didn't have the GATA family on their list of things to look at for the molecular etiology of this disease. And each one of these green and red squares is an, a hypothesis that links a particular transcription factor to a particular disease or a particular disease to a particular cell type, many of which I think are previously known and understood, but quite a few of which are novel and interesting. And this, by the way, is a, is a, is a great loci, um, a classic loci, just to illustrate this. It's actually in a gene desert. Um, it's a notorious region because of the different uh, um, uh, immune-related um, SNPs in this region, and here's a SNP that lines up bang in this region that's active in T helper cells and has a GATA2 signal. Now, I won't go into this. this the, we did encode not for nature papers, not for me to give presentations, not for anything else, but for the rest of the community to use it. And there's all sorts of different ways to use it. From the raw data, there's this wonderful, great, very Californian way of looking at the genome here. Um, and I think it's beautiful. But there is this sophisticated, even more beautiful, <laughs> European way of looking at the genome. Um, and uh, if you like your, your penalized uh, Californian style, I, I understand that. I also like that. But occasionally, I like to go back to the old country uh, and uh, um, uh, uh, have a classy... Uh, Bordeaux or something like that. Uh, and if you want to, you know, feel the true richness uh, of a European experience, uh, come here. And uh, more uh, joking aside, um, there is friendly competition with our wonderful colleagues at UCSC about trying to deliver this complexity of information to it. And if you haven't met this thing, it will, can seriously make your life easier. This is called the Variant Effect Predictor. And these regulatory elements are now integrated into this. This means if you just present this tool with the SNPs that you have generated, variants that come from your exomes, you do not have to keep up to date with all this regulatory information. Ensemble will do the heavy lifting for you. 
So, very quickly, I just wanted to mention one thing, because it is about DNA. And my colleague, who's a mathematician, this is uh, Brits and pubs. I don't know quite what it is. Um, but we were over a beer, and Nick uh, Goldman said, um, at some point, all the data we're going to store is going to be DNA sequence. And we're thinking about very cost-effective, low-electricity digital storage devices. And we said to ourselves, wait a second. We know a zero-electricity nano-digital storage device. It's called DNA. And so, in fact, um, we created a scheme for storing using DNA as a hard disk. And I won't go into the details here, but um, uh, one gram's worth of DNA can robustly store two petabytes of information. You could fit the world's information on this stage uh, in DNA sequence, uh, in zettabytes, with all the redundancy required to, uh, to make uh, to make that work. And uh, we did a little bit of economic modeling here, and the take home message is that if you wanted to store something for about over 500 years or over 1,000 years, we believe it's cost effective now to store stuff as DNA if you have a 1,000 year archiving uh, thing. So if there's somebody from the Smithsonian here um, who, who would like, or the Library of Congress, who'd like the information in the Library of Congress, uh, uh, robustly stored for a thousand years, I have a solution uh, for you. Um, and that, uh, Nick, um, uh, do read, read about it. We had a lot of fun uh, doing this, and it's sort of just this side of crazy, is the way I describe that. So these are the, I've talked mainly about ENCODE. These are the 410 authors of ENCODE. My name is in here somewhere. Um, but in fact, there are um, a couple of people that really should be picked out. So Ian Dunham worked with me at the EBI, and Angel Kunjai worked with a variety of people, but at Stanford, uh, with Mike and with Seraphim versus Lagu. And let me just restress the, the data production leads. I think people like me get a disproportionate amount of credit for this project. These people do not get a disproportionate amount of credit. So if anybody says, I was a data production person to encode, say, thank you very much. I hear you don't get thank you enough. Um, and this is the group, Shelley, Patrick, Carrie, Francis, Chuck, Seth, Jen, Vichy, Raj, Janet, Brian, Stephen, Bumke, Flo, Kate, Peter, Alexis, Marta, Noam, Jeremy, Lingen, and Nathan. And it, it was all funded by NHGRI. So thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Questions? No. Okay, so we'll take a break now and we will start again at 325.